Good afternoon and welcome to the DevNet Zone, even if it's only Thursday. Hopefully this is not your first session. Um, my name is Julio and I uh, drive programmability for Cisco and EMER. And today I'm here to talk to you about, yeah, why you need, and I would say basically why everyone here at Cisco Live actually needs a Kubernetes cluster. They actually need one, and they actually need to build it. You know, if it's much better to build it than you know, buying something that is already done. Um, but most importantly, I'm here to convince you not only about the cluster, but also about why you should not listen to all the naysayers saying, you know, big blockers about why you should not do this. And I'm not talking about your wife telling you, okay, don't spend your, your time or your money on this. I'm talking about, you know, the rest of the people. So, yeah, I know that the struggle is real, but by the end of the session, I'm pretty sure you'll be convinced. So, um, why did this happen to me? Well, two years ago, I read somewhere that Google is deploying more than 2 billion application containers per week. And I was flabbergasted, like, okay, how is that even possible? I mean, I just learned Docker, and I was just, you know, using my Docker run commands. I was like, okay, is, is someone at Google just running Docker run commands to actually, you know, initiate those containers, two billion containers a week? I mean, how many people work there? So I was not convinced, and then I learned that they realized, you know, that actually, you know, years ago, when they started working with containers, they had to have a solution that could manage those containers at scale on a big pool of infrastructure. So they had a lot of servers and they wanted to actually you know, work with those containers at scale. And they wanted the, uh, the solution to be adaptive, so in case that some of the servers fail, you know, the solution would re-adapt and all the containers and workloads would be redistributed somewhere else. And that's fantastic. You know, they, they were doing a lot of work there and the outcome of that project that internally was called Borg translated into an open source project called Kubernetes and Kubernetes is the next big thing, or the best thing, I would say, right, right now, since sliced bread. Why? Because it's the best operations teams that you could ever have. It's a magical system where you tell him, hey, what you want, and the system will translate it into the actions that it needs to do to make you happy. That's perfect. Declarative formats. I tell the system that I would like my application to have this microservice with 10 replicas of that container and this other microservice with 12. And then I tell that this, this second ma um, microservice should not be reachable from the internet and this one should only, only be reachable from this. And he handles all these interactions as services and ingress resources and all that stuff. He, he does everything for you. And that's really, really cool. If you think about it, you don't have to be concerned about what fails in your infrastructure because the system will adapt to that. And that's pretty, pretty cool, right? So it got to a point where I've heard Kelsey Hightower, in case you, you, know, you know the Google evangelist, talking about Kubernetes and saying that kubectl is the new SSH. Taking a look at your faces, I guess you are more or less, well, except some guys, more like me, I'm 44. Uh, I've heard or I've been using SSH for 20 years and living off of SSH for 20 years. But now it looks like there's a brand new thing, especially for software development, which is called kubectl or kube control or kube cattle or however people want to call it. But it's, you know, the, the way that you control a Kubernetes cluster. It's, it's the CLI command that you use for that. So it's like, oh, when I heard about this, I want to learn about this. I want to learn about Kubernetes. I want to learn about kube cattle. I want to make sure that I'm not left behind. If you think about it, DevOps practices are what we are leveraging and applying more and more also into the network configuration, what we call net DevOps. So it's you know, quite interesting to understand how it works in the, world, in the world of software development and DevOps. So yeah, I was really, really excited about this. So what did I do? I went to my local meetup in my city. I come from Madrid and there is a local meetup a meeting that we have there in the city from people that are interested in this topic. So I went there just to learn. Okay, I want to understand what is about Kubernetes, how it works, and so on. And there, I found a group of people very fluent in Kubernetes, but they were like, um, my new friends, except that 
they had a number of things to tell me that basically broke my heart. They told me first, hey, you're really thinking about doing this thing? Are you really thinking about building your own Kubernetes cluster? Because Kubernetes is complex. I think there, it was a way to tell me that I'm a little bit dumb, but it's like you're not going to get it. But, but yeah, I mean, they, they were telling me it's complex, so you, know, you will need time, and it's not like you do this in a day. You really need to spend some time and study. OK. So I was up for the challenge. I'll do it. No worries. It was like, OK, yeah, yeah I know you will spend time. But if you try to build it, hardware is really expensive, and you don't look rich at all. So yeah. You will have to spend money. And uh, if you want to spend money, and again, you know, I ha will have to talk to my wife about that because you know, I'm not sure about this. So I will have to find a way around that as well. Even if I have the money, they were telling me that installing Kubernetes is a long process. If you see, uh, for example, Kelsey Hightower again, uh, one of the creators of Borg, creators of Kubernetes, he's got this uh, GitHub repo where he talks about how to uh, install Kubernetes, and it's called the hard way. How to install Kubernetes the hard way. Because installing Kubernetes, if you take a look at that repo, would take, for me, a lifetime. You know, it, it's like really complex. There are a number of things to do there. So it was also going to be a difficulty for me if you want to get started in this process of getting your Kubernetes cluster running. OK, let's say, they were telling me, let's say that you handle it, and let's say that you are bright enough as to get it working. Um, when you want to deploy your applications, modern applications are based on microservices. And all these microservices, you configure them, or you declare what you want them to do, in YAML files called manifests. And you will need one manifest for each one of your deployments, and for each one of your uh, services, so the way that you access those, de those deployments, and for each one of the, your ingress resources. So basically, it's a ton of files, and uh, you're not going to get it. I mean, it's, it, it's difficult. I was like, OK, okay this, is, this is getting worse by the minute. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to bury the required number of hours. That's the way that we engineers work, right? I mean, we bury hours, and we spend as much time as required. And they were like, yeah, even if you accomplish the installation of your application on the cluster, you're not going to be able to monitor it. You know, you will never know how it, it's going. You know, it will be stuck, and it will be unresponsive, and you will never know what's happening in there. So forget about monitoring. Forget, forget about getting any kind of relevant information out of that thing. I was like, OK. Oof, this is, I mean, this is overwhelming. You know, I don't know if I will ever be able to do it. And the last concern was the one that hurted me really deep, which is you cannot take it on holiday with you. Even if you build something at your home, you're not going to be able to take it anywhere because it's so big and it's noisy and it requires air conditioning and it requires you know, refrigeration for it, but, but also for the noise. I mean, it requires basically you know, taking care of that. So you're not going to be able to take it on holiday. My wife was happy about that. I mean, don't get me wrong. But I wanted to come to this kind of events and brag about it. You know, even to our remote audience, we are bragging about the real thing here. So I wanted to make sure that I could address all these, you know, different concerns and stoppers and blockers that they were telling me, like, you will never do it. So I will try during the session today to explore all of these different blockers so that you can really get how I did it, so that you don't have to waste your time trying to figure it out yourselves, because I've already wasted two years of my life. So you get it for free. This is two years ago, January 2018. Great. I just created my Twitter handle just a mere 12 years after Twitter was created. I'm always you know, ahead of the curve. And yeah, I created this. You can see that it's called uh, Julio DevOps. So basically, I'm just um, only talking about, uh, about DevOps topics and not DevOps topics. So it's really focused on this. I'm not following any news or whatever. Just focus on that. So I created that user, and I, um, I started you know, learning about it. And uh, as I said, I'm 44. So how do I learn? I buy a physical book. I don't want those e-books or PDFs or whatever. I, I bought a physical book because that's who I am. So this physical book is the one that you see in the photo. Kubernetes up and running, that's what Santa brought me on uh, the, the Christmas from uh, 2017 to 2018. And that was great, because I could just very easily go to sleep reading the book, 
um, it was very, very interesting. And basically, all the complexity associated to Kubernetes was covered in there. It's written by the creators of you know, the product. So they are the best ones to describe you know, how it works and what are the foundational constructs that you need to understand so that you can work with Kubernetes. Perfect. I spent one month reading it. I'm not a fast reader, especially by night. So yeah, got to understand how Kubernetes works. Um, by that time, I understood what they meant. Like, I don't know if you have explored eBay finding hardware. I know I did it 20 years ago for my CCIE, and I still remember I was living alone, so it was okay to have you know, a small rack at home because you know, I was on my own. But with a family, you don't want to spend a lot of money on things. And eBay is full of servers, but they are pricey and they occupy a lot of space. So in my small apartment, that would not fit. That would never fly. So that's on one side. On the other side is that I'm a very cheap guy. So my budget for this project was 300 euros. That's all I got. And I'm so sorry that my manager is not here because I would really like him to see the slide. But yeah, 300. That's my budget, not more than that. If it's higher, I'm not interested. I'm not spending a penny more. So yeah, I passed this to the purchase department. And my wife said, yeah, go for it. And eventually, I decided, like, yeah, let's go for it. You know, I'm going to buy uh, everything that I need to build my own cluster. Uh, but with $300, you don't go so far, that far. I mean, you, 300 euros, sorry. You don't go that far. Um, so what did I do? Well, basically, I went to Amazon, and um, I looked for cheap stuff, you know, like the cheapest. And what's the cheapest thing? Well, you get Raspberry Pis for, three, for 30 bucks. Um, you get some cheap Ethernet cables. You get even a special piece of furniture that you can use to put the Raspberry Pis in. So basically, all the most basic stuff. Um, and I just put everything together. Um, and that was great. It was a great exercise because I don't know about you people, but for me, there is something visceral about having a physical setup that I can just unplug the power supply from. I mean, it's like, let's see what happens. Now, this is the real world. So yeah, go for it. So I built this thing. For the remote audience, if they are not seeing the local one, this is the, the thing that I built. But when you go full page, you know, like splash page with everything all together, you, you don't really get a feeling about you know, how small this thing is. It's, it's really tiny. You know, I can get it in my bag with me, and I will just take it everywhere, except where I need to go you know, on a plane, because customs people do not like my thing. But you know, you get a banana for scale so that you can really understand remote audience, you know, how small this thing is. It's the size of a banana. And that's fantastic. Banana for scale, you know, it's kind of the, the reference that everyone understands. And we get a banana also here so that you can see that even in its current you know, assortment, it's still the size of a banana. So that was great. You know, I learned a lot on the process of you know, understanding how uh, to build the cluster itself, the Raspberry Pis and the connectivity and everything. That's cool. But then I went into the third uh, challenge. You know, if you remember, it's Kubernetes is complex. Kubernetes cluster is going to be really expensive. Now, the third one is uh, the installation. It's really, really, really cumbersome. You need to do a lot of stuff. You need to do a lot of st steps. And you need to follow these guides that are like 20 pages. So mm, I said, OK, uh, so how can I do it? So I started exploring. And I found that there is something that I would like to show you today. So let's go into demos. I'm just going to um, run uh, the demos uh, with my clicker. Uh, I've programmed the system so that it does it itself. Um, I have fat fingers. I'm not good at speaking and writing at the same time. I'm not good at doing two things at the same time, basically on anything, but especially on this. So I just want to show you um, how it works. So this is the, 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 this cluster. And I'm just doing uh, kubectl get notes, just to show you that there is nothing configured at the moment, so no resources found. So I'm just going to run this command called ketchup install, well, k3s app install. And I'm just going to give it the IP address of my master node. I'm connected to the Wi-Fi here. So this command, ketchup, it's going to install the master node. So installing the master node, it's from scratch, like downloading the image, installing it in the master node, and making sure that it's absolutely ready to start working as the master in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, K3S, it's not K8S. You remember K8S is the kind of the acronym that we have for Kubernetes. But this is K3S. It's something similar. Why am I using this? Well, basically because K3S is um, a subset 
of all the Kubernetes code that, whether you believe it or not, already includes a lot of legacy things that we don't actually need, that they are there because of you know, backwards compatibility. So K3S has removed all of that, all the, all the libraries that you don't need and all that stuff, and stay with the essential. So basically, you get Kubernetes, but the simplified version. And it's very, very cool, because you can ride, run it on 50 megs. It's an executable of 50 megs that you can run in your worker and master nodes. So very cool. I install it, and uh, it says, yeah, fantastic. It's, it's gone well. And then I run a kubectl get nodes. As you can see here, it says, again, no resources found. Why? Because um, I have not exported my kubeconfig for the new setup. So I export the export kubeconfig. So I get the new one, and then I'm ready to go. I will just say kubectl get nodes, and then I see that my master is ready. Basically, it has taken me, I don't know, uh, 45 seconds you know, to deploy my master node. So now I'm going to be doing exactly the same, but for my master. You see I have three different Raspberry Pis for the worker nodes, three worker nodes and one master. So I will do exactly the same. I will just say ketchup, and then in this case, I will say join 101, which is the IP address of my worker node, to the, one, the IP address of my master node, which is 100. One single command. I will just say go for it, and it will install uh, the, mas the worker, one, worker one node. I will say the same for worker two, and I will say, yeah, you go for it. Take a, I mean, just, just take a look at the amount of time that it's taking, like nothing. And then I will say the same for the third node, for the third worker node. Just join the master. The master is already set. So it's going. It's doing everything. And then I take a look at the nodes again. On the first iteration, I, am, I have worker one and two, but not the third. But in the second iteration, I have worker one, two, three, and the master node. When they were telling me that installing Kubernetes is difficult, well, maybe in the past. Not today. Today, not on my watch. Here, I'm demonstrating how you can install a full Kubernetes cluster with four nodes. One is a master, three worker nodes. One command per node in 90 seconds. This is mind-blowing for me. I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing for everyone that has ever had to install Kubernetes. It's really, really cool. Next challenge. Yeah, sure. I mean, you've deployed your cluster. You have these fancy tricks, you know, with that new tool. But when you need to deploy actual application, it's going to be really difficult. You know, kubectl commands for all the different manifests and you know services. A micro, um, and your microservices need um, access, so services and ingress resources, and it's going to take a lot of time. So I said, um, okay, yeah. So first of all, I don't even have an application. I, I, I'm not a developer, so I'm not going to start creating in Java or whatever any application. But my colleague Hank from you know, the DevNet area, probably you've seen him uh, in any other session, developed a couple of years ago uh, this session, uh, sorry, this uh, application. And this application is a great example of how real world microservices based applications, modern applications, look like. Why? Because it's got a number of microservices that interact in between them. So in this case, you have users that may be accessing via browser and HTTP front end. In, uh, you know, they are, uh, it's implemented with a My Hero UI frontend and HTTP server, or they can be accessing it via WebEx Teams into a My Hero Teams microservice, or maybe even from Alexa, and they might be you know, accessing the application with a different interface using Lambda function as a service functions. So that goes into the middleware, and then from, a, from there to a queuing system, and the queuing system into a database, and all of that is implemented with microservices. So you can get that this is complex, right? I mean, it's like a number of them interacting with APIs and REST and JSON. So all of that you know, is what he de developed. So I said, OK, I'm going to install this. But yeah, it looks really complex, right? So I don't know how I'm going to do it. So I started taking a look at how to do it. And that's my second demo. How am I going to deploy this, my hero, you, um, to develop who, uh, sorry, to uh, guess what is the, who is the best superhero? I'm just going to deploy it for you. And I'm just going to do it with uh, one command, which is kubectl, kubectl apply one specific set of files that reside in my, my hero folder. So I'm just going to apply that with one single command. And I'm going to see how all the services and deployments get automatically created. So I can see that everything has been created. If I take a look at how they are doing, I take a look at the pods, and I see they are creating the containers. And by the next time that I do kubectl get pods, show me the containers, show me the microservices that are running, I see that all of them are running. 
I'm like, okay, so this is it. I mean, is, is it working? So I go into my website, you know, the front end, the HTTP front end. Just to verify if it's really there or not. And you can just go there if you want. I mean, it's uh, UI-myhero, user interface, myhero.ngrok.io. So that's the way that I'm accessing it right now. So I go there, and then I see my application is there. I said, like, okay, so that didn't look that difficult. You know, basically what I did was just run one kubectl command, and it was working. So again, when people were telling me it's difficult to deploy, it, well, yes and no. I mean, if you get the manifest from the developer, which is usually the case, I mean, from the developer, you get all the manifests on how you, he has been deploying it. With one command, in 45 seconds, the whole application has been developed, deployed. So, yeah, we are doing good, right? I mean, we have deployed a cluster in 90 seconds, and our application is in production in 45 seconds. Very cool. So I was surprised, like, oh, okay, we can find ways around you know, this complexity. So I went into onto the next challenge. Hey, there is no easy way to monitor this thing. How do I monitor it? I, there, there's nothing that I can do. Well, yes and no. If I go back to my demo, let me show you how I did it. There is a command under kubectl, which is top. And top shows me exactly what is my consumption in terms of memory and CPU for each one of my nodes kubectl top node. It shows me that I have for master and for the workers, I see the CPU consumption and I see memory consumption in percentage, but also in megs or millicores. So I was getting information. I could see very easily, you know, how my worker and, um, and master nodes were doing. But I wanted also to take a look at the pods. How are the pods doing? I mean, are they really working fine or not? So what I can see here is, again, consumption for each one of my microservices. I could really see how they are doing in terms of CPU consumption and memory. Cool stuff. So I gain access into this visibility. But honestly, who monitors applications or you know, cluster consumption using this kind of CLI? Nobody. So I needed to find another way. So in this case, I, I finally realized that there are APIs, APIs that you can use to access those. So I went there, and you can see that there is a way to use kubectl to access those APIs and take a look at what's in there. So I did that. I took a look at the APIs for the nodes and found out that you can find that this JSON result actually shows you exactly the data that you are looking for, the information about all the different usage for all the different points in time. So that's fantastic. I can see that for the nodes. May I see that also for my own pods? Yeah, I can also do it for the pods. It's both for the uh, nodes, but also for the pods. So that's great. Um, let's see now that, OK, those APIs, I'm taking a look at them from kubectl commands. But that's not the way that you access APIs, right? You access APIs from RESTful APIs. You know, that's the way that you access via HTTP methods. You do gets and put and post, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to actually take a look at how they look from curl. But the problem is that all of those APIs, the kubelet APIs, reside in the master node here, which is not reachable from the outside world. So what I did is I created a proxy from port 8080 in my computer going into the, the, the um, Kubernetes cluster. So with that, I can, it says it's starting to serve uh, on port 8080, and now I can do curl. I can just emulate these HTTP methods using the curl uh, CLI. So I took a look at localhost 8080, that's my proxy, going into the APIs, and you can see that I'm accessing exactly the same kind of information. So that means that this small thing is serving APIs with all the information about monitoring for um, my cluster. So that's great. That means that, well, actually I can monitor my cluster very easily. I can monitor my nodes, my pods, the CPU and the memory, and I can do it both from the CLI and the APIs. Great, it looks like we are doing fantastically well. But that was that last challenge, if you remember, the one that really hurt me inside, which is you cannot move that thing anywhere, right? Well, it's actually here, and it's serving the application for you. So basically, we, are, we have access to it. I mean, we, we are getting to it. So how are we doing it? Well, let me step a little bit back just to show you. When I deployed it at home, uh, the same as when you deploy this at home, uh, you will have the need for the application to be accessible from the outside. So basically, there are certain microservices that needs to be accessed from the outside world. The way that you are accessing from your, from your mobile phone to my hero application to vote for the best superhero, 
you will need to access those microservices. How, so how do I make this thing reachable from the outside world? And not only the front end for HTTP, but also when I'm voting via WebEx Teams, because you can vote via WebEx Teams or Alexa, you can just talk to it and say, hey, I want to vote for the best superhero. How do you make that accessible? You need a connectivity from the outside world, from the internet, into something that resides here. And this here means that I'm behind a router. And at home, I'm residing behind my home router. And I'm lucky because I have the password for that, so I can configure it, right? I can just do some mappings of the external port to the internal IP, and I can just make some magic happen so that from the outside world, I create dynamic um, DNS entries that applies to the different microservices that I need to access, and then I redirect everything to my external IP in the one port of my router, and then internally I map it with ingress resources in the Kubernetes cluster. That's great for home. But how do I move that here? Here there is a corporate router somewhere that I, wouldn't, I cannot even dream of touching. You know, I cannot configure anything there. So how do I gain access you know, to this on the road when I'm here or when I'm where I'm whatever? So how do I do that? How is it working here? Well, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating tunnels using a tool called Engrok which basically just gives me access from all these different you know, mm, uh, URLs via the reverse SSH tunnel that goes through the corporate router, shh, don't tell anyone, and then it goes into my ingress resource so that I can just access directly this. And that's why you can access the application that is residing here. <coughs> the sorry, the beauty of it is that you can just move the cluster anywhere and you can just have your workload working anywhere. So that's freaking awesome. That's really cool. I mean, it's been two years of my life, so that, that's why you can tell that I'm excited. So this was kind of an, a window into a sea of information that as a network engineer, which is my background, I was not aware of. You know, it, it, it was like magic. I, I was not aware of any of this. So what did I do? Well, uh, I typed. And I typed a lot, like two years of typing. Uh, and why? Well, basically because I don't have a very good memory. So what I did was I wrote a love letter but it was a love letter to myself. Because with this memory, I would never be able to remember what I've done. I can barely remember what I did yesterday. Um, so I wrote something called uh, the Hands-On with DevOps white paper, with a special emphasis on hands-on. Because if you've been to DevOps sessions, I'm so fed up about the cultural change that you need to go through and your company's reorganization is like, yeah, but I'm an engineer. Show me the real stuff. Show me what is the reality, the tools that you are using and all that stuff. So that's why I wrote this, hands-on with DevOps for practical people like me. My present to the community was, yeah, this love letter, there's no point in keeping it to myself. Let's just make it public. And you can reach uh, the, the website where I'm hosting it, which is GitHub. It's a repo there. And you can just reach it via cs.co slash Julio DevOps. There you will find everything that I know about not only the banana cluster thing, but also about many other topics from Docker containers to Kubernetes to Istio to Helm as a package manager, cloud native DevOps tools, um, CI CD pipelines, all oh, the whole enchilada. Everything is here. You just go there, you will find everything that you need to know and more. And most importantly, everything, the code and everything that you need to replicate yourself, maybe here, maybe in a public cloud environment, maybe at the sandbox, where we have very, very nice Cisco Container Platform sandboxes for free available for you so that you can take a look at those. Hope you get excited about this. If you get questions about how you can replicate this setup yourself, please reach out to me. You can reach me on social media or directly to my uh, email or WebEx teams. Uh, please complete your survey. Uh, I'm so sorry again that my boss is not here. I'm getting paid on the survey, so please complete it. It's really important. If you complete four of them, you get a t-shirt, so that's really, really important for you. But yeah, it's also important for me. Thank you for your time. <laughs>